Welcome to today's webinar, brought to you courtesy of Rethink Retail and Diebold Nixdorf. And today we're going to be discussing the future proofing your retail stores, revolutionize CX and boost ROI with today's best AI solutions. So hopefully that's what you were expecting. Um, but what you should be expecting is a fantastic panel who I will introduce in just a second. Uh, my name is Andrew Busby. I'm your host. Uh, moderator, referee, call it what you like for today. Um, and if you've ever wondered how to integrate artificial intelligence, we'll call it AI from uh, now on for the sake of time. How you, if you ever wonder how to integrate it into your store, then wonder no more, because over the course of the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to be discussing and showcasing the benefits of doing that. Uh, both in the stores and we'll also cover um, shrink reduction as well because we know that's a very hot topic um, at uh, sadly at uh, the moment. Um, so without further ado, uh, as I said, my name is Andrew Busby. I'm founder of Retail Reflections. I'm delighted to welcome and I'll go uh, from kind of the way I see it from uh, clockwise. So my bottom left, if you like, uh, the founder and CEO of Sea Change. Uh, Jason Silogu. Jason, welcome. Thanks for coming along. Um, next, we have Martin Bailey, who's the founder of the MWB Advisory and also um, Retail Rethink Board Advisory member. Welcome, Martin. Thank you. And we also have the Vice President of Global Retail Strategy and Regional Vice President of Americas at Dewald Nixdorf, Arvin Jawa. Welcome, Arvin. Thanks. So, our esteemed pal, so let's get into this because we're going to be covering quite a bit uh, in, uh, as I said, the next 45 minutes. So kind of getting things kicked off. Um, you know, we know from personalized uh, recommendations to support AI powered solutions have revolutionized the way that businesses interact uh, with their customers. You know, uh, we're always looking for those seamless, sufficient experiences. Um, so. Martin, I'll come to you first. How do you think that AI technology has changed in recent years? And um, what are retailers and consumers kind of feeling about it? So look, uh, it's not a new topic, AI, it's well over a decade, but I think it's came to life post COVID when the world went into perma crisis and the consumer changed literally overnight uh, what they want, when they want it and how they want it. So AI has the ability um, to um, analyze vast amounts of customer data, therefore can speedily give us hyper-personalization, which gives us hyper-recommendations and improve satisfaction and ultimately for the business, improve turnover and sales. So there is a relationship to why you would use uh, AI and the likes of, I don't know, customer insights and recommendations, um, even frictionless experience that we'll talk about quite a bit around the checkout area, that's AI powered, um, seamless communication flows like chatbots that we have in our lives uh, that is improving 24 access to a, a retailer or a brand about any question and taking away any conflict. So we use AI on a daily basis. Um, businesses use AI on a daily basis for well over a decade, but come to the forefront because of um, life post COVID. So, AI has been able to give uh, the business as well as the consumer better personalization, better efficiency, and better convenience, which is ultimately the three big questions in the world today for consumers. So basically, you're saying that we should be thankful for COVID. It, at least it did. What has COVID <laughs> ever done for us? Acceler <laughs> well, it's accelerated AI. <laughs> accelerated. <laughs> uh, I want to come to you, Arvin. Um, yeah. Are people excited about this or are they a bit hesitant about integrating and adopting these types of uh, technologies? Oh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, you know, I think there are probably two groups of people with different sentiments here, uh, retailers on the one hand and perhaps consumers on another bucket. Um, from the retailer perspective, I'd say there's tremendous interest and intrigue. Uh, no one wants to be left behind right now. I think there may be even a, a bit of FOMO, fear of missing out to some degree. We're seeing our customers trial and test numerous use cases, addressing a wide array of business challenges. So I think for this group of retailers, I'll summarize that perhaps the sentiment is 
cautious optimism and excitement. Um, from a consumer perspective, I think we're always going to see at the start of any technology introduction, a combination of excitement and hesitancy, um, perhaps depending upon whom you query, right? Savvy consumers who see value, convenience, as Martin was saying, um, you know, in terms of time savings or experience improvements, they're going to be keen to adopt. Consumers who are more of technophobes will probably be averse. So I think the main message is that if there's value to be had, either from a retailer perspective or from a consumer perspective, and the technology is easy to use, then there's excitement. And for those who don't see or understand the value yet, there's going to be some hesitancy. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Yeah, I mean, you always get the early adopters who and, and the and the uh, the laggards who are a bit of a technophobes, as you uh, rightly exactly. put it. Um, so I think I think we we probably agree that you know the, the adoption of AI in, in in retail is is crucial. It's critical to um, improve a number of things, but particularly customer experience, optimization of operations, and ultimately, as I think you're saying, Martin, gaining a competitive edge in in the marketplace. So I'll come back to you, Martin. How do you think that AI technology can enhance that customer experience in uh, in retail? Uh, so it's obviously built to do that with big data and being able to put, to personalize. So the first point would be that personalization and hyper personalization. It obviously helps the consumer because you know me, you know what I want, when I want it, how I mm -hmm. want it. So there's like that convenience element. But even for the, the for the business under personalization, uh, it means that you're targeting uh, promotions, discounts, uh, right information to the right person based on the uh, profile. So actually the relationship becomes a loyalty relationship, which is essentially hyper-personalization. Um, I said earlier on around chatbots and, and, uh, uh, and virtual assistants, you have 24 access to the brand. You have 24 access to ask questions. You have 24-7 uh, to ask, uh, to get answers. So you're now taking away friction and potentially conflict. And the uh, important part of the, the, the voice recognition or indeed uh, these chatbots, the advancement has been so good. They have a, an ability to have a natural language language processing system that is so advanced so they can pick up accents. It, all that friction of maybe, I don't know, 15 years ago is gone now. And I think that becomes now seamless as well. There's an important development in particular around sentimental, um, sentiment, sorry, uh, analysis and analytics. So actually what AI can do with that large data can surf over the social media, build trends, positive trends, negative trends, and can help the retailer really see what's out there and what they're hearing. And I think that is a very powerful tool in terms of understanding the customer, the trends and the sentiment of the customer, what's right and what's maybe not right that they have to resolve. So there's constant learning, which is essentially what AI does as well. And look, maybe another good example would be VR and AR is massively enhanced by AI because of the data. So that kind of virtual experience that we will move into in years to come, AI is the foundation and, and a big part of the process and part of that and the dynamics of that as well. So look, it, it can help um, personalization, convenience and efficiency. I know I've repeated it a uh, second time now, but ultimately that's what we, the consumers want mm -hmm. and actually what the retailers have to deliver today, yesterday, and indeed tomorrow when I talk about VA and a, a VR and AR as well. So it, it is mm -hmm. an important tool to build agility towards learning what your custom is, uh, likes, and how they want to shop with you. Yeah, that's interesting what you say about AR and VR, because I've always felt that for years that sort of technology was kind of, it wasn't sure what dress or whatever outfit to put on to come to the party. Uh, but now that, that, that's a really interesting point about AI, perhaps enabling that so that there really is a, a use case there, there for us. That, that's exciting. Um, I want to come to you, Jason, because you had a bit of an easy ride so far. So we'll we'll put that right uh, straight away. Um, so yeah, technology and friction. So how how do you see the technology reducing friction, particularly in the in the customer journey and you know, as an example, uh, the, the, the checkout experience. Well, if, if you think about the, the revolution that online shopping brought and how frictionless relatively online shopping is, it gives you an idea as to, um, you know, what the friction points are in, in physical shopping, you know. So what, what, 
the, the, the friction areas are kind of obvious, right? It's basically people finding the stuff that they want to buy. So, so finding the, 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 you know, the stuff and the shelves and the location. It's the items that they want to buy being stocked on the shelves, right? Um, it's, um, you know, once you've got all your stuff, it's then a question of, you know, you just want to get out, right? So you want to check your stuff out and leave the store. So then it's yeah. sort of friction out the checkouts. Um, so at the checkouts, for example, if it's a self-checkout, if the item doesn't have a barcode, you have to go through the, through the dreaded sort of, you know, lookup item sort of uh, process, which is a bit painful. Or the other sort of friction areas are, you know, the dreaded, um, you know, uh, unknown item in the bagging area uh, issue and, and the way scales, if there are way scales, you know, slowing down the process. So the, 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 there's, you know, the the... If you if you hold up online shopping as the example that you want to reach, and uh, you think about digitizing the physical shopping experience, you know that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to take away all those friction points in terms of finding products, checking them out, leaving the store as seamlessly as possible. Yeah, yeah. Um, Arvin, in terms of um, competitive edge, what sort of use cases are you seeing uh, for these types of technologies? You know what, Andrew, I. Uh... I decided I would use chat GPT to get my answer for this question. And you know what it came back with when I said, what are the most compelling use cases for retail AI applications? And, and Martin had all the answers and Jason had all the answers. Creating personalized shopping experiences, demand forecasting and inventory management, dynamic pricing, chatbots, virtual assistants, they're all there. Fantastic, great mm -hmm. answers. Uh, what we're particularly excited about is applying AI at checkout. And we're doing some of that work with, with Jason and his team at Sea Change. The checkout experience is all about improving throughput, reducing friction points within that journey, specifically in the self-service journey. Um, friction comes in several areas, mostly in the form of what we call interventions. For example, uh, needing to get your age verified or your ID checked to buy age-restricted mm -hmm. product or needing help. Uh, to locate the actual lookup code for fresh produce or loose random weight item. Imagine if we could eliminate 50 to 80% of those inter interventions with AI. The process would be so smooth. People would adopt self-service even faster than they have in the past. So we improve customer experience that way. We improve the associate experience who can now do things besides checking IDs. We maximize the investment in technology spend. And so that's really exciting for us. There are also additional competitive advantages, I think, that can be created by preventing theft, reducing unintentional loss. AI has that ability to analyze transaction data to detect unusual patterns that indicate fraudulent activities. And I think that's going to help retailers prevent fraud and shrink, ultimately protect consumers, staff, and the business. Yeah, no, absolutely. And going back to uh, yeah, the, the age, you know, when I buy a bottle of wine, I think it's fairly obvious that I'm over 21, but, you know, I still have to get uh, a manual a manual check. Um, so I want to move on now to enhancing the customer journey with, with AI, uh, because retailers are, I think, you know, there may still be some who, who haven't really begun their, their journey yet, but uh, increasingly they are turning to, to this sort of technology to create frictionless checkout experiences and so forth. So coming back to you, Arvin, how do you think this is changing the shopper journey and, and also, more importantly, retail operations as a whole? You know, just stepping back, retail, as we know, as an industry, has been on what I like to call an automation rocket ship. Retailers have been on a journey of capitalizing on automation to improve business outcomes for some time now. And AI technology, in my opinion, it's not another journey, another rocket. It's really rocket fuel. It's right. going to help continue the automation journey. And so when it comes to checkout and shopping journeys, we like to think of things through the frame or the lens of S-curves. Remember those nifty things we looked at in strategy, <laughs> innovation R&D, uh, early adoption, and then acceleration into the market, eventually plateauing. Those S-curves. And we see an S-curve for traditional assisted checkout, right, at the point of sale, which is now at scale, mass adoption, after many, many decades. It's still climbing, believe it or not. We see another S-curve 
in self-checkout, which is still in the growth phase, right? It's been around for 20 years, but it's still growing. It's being adopted in multiple industry verticals. It's being adopted in different use cases. And now there's this new checkout journey, uh, types like automated smart carts and mobile self-scanning and, of course, autonomous checkout. And that that's its own S-curve, right? It, it's way down at that early trough at the beginning of the S. You know, It's got its fits and starts. Trajectories aren't smooth. It's ebbing and flowing depending upon its relation to adoption and, and true benefit. Um, in my opinion, AI will really create more benefit in the short term on the first two S curves, enhancing and augmenting the adoption of self-service checkout more than it will drive the adoption of autonomous checkout, at least in the short term. Mm -hmm. um, and that's seen right now with what's happening with some of the just walk out offerings and types of journeys. There's going to be a time and a place. It's just not in the short term. And I think retailers know their customers and the pace at which they'll adopt new things, they'll only do that at a certain pace. And so the revolutionary disruptive S-curve of intelligent autonomous checkout just hasn't proven its full value yet. So AI is going to help with the first two S-curves more than the third. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's for, for retailers to kind of take the customer on that journey and almost hold them by the hand and, and not to you know, give them a sudden jolt, but just ease them along the, the journey that they want? to take them on. I, I think so. And I think they also recognize that there are different consumer bases and different audiences who will help bring others along, right? You're going to yeah. have the early adopters and you'll have the, the laggers and the technophobes, yeah. but you slowly they help each other. So retailers yeah. understand that. Sure, sure. Um, Jason, so kind of building on uh, some of that, uh, I wanted to ask about image recognition. Um, how, how is image recognition changing the way that, uh, that we shop? I mean, if you if you think about the um, the, the ability for um, different points within a store to recognise for the AI to recognise um, products, so imagine that a shopper with their mobile phone can point their mobile phone at different products on the shelves, have it instantly recognise it, and look up how many calories does it have, what is price, what is availability, you know, the reviews for that product. If you imagine the CCTV system within the store recognizing specific products, you know, you can then have live notifications to the staff to restock the shelves, which means that the products will be you know, always available for the shoppers. Okay. Or, or if at the checkout, if the checkouts are able to recognize, you know, every single specific item that gets checked out, there's never unknown items on the shop in the in the basket area anymore, by definition, because the system already recognizes everything. You'll never leave your purse or your mobile phone behind on a checkout because the system will recognize that and, and, and notify, right? Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you won't need to worry about, you know, not having barcode items and having to, to, to look it up and going through long pick lists. The, the other area is, is in terms of miscans, right? Um, there are you know, a number of situations where people accidentally misscan and then they need, um, as Arvin was saying, you know, assistance. And that just delays the whole process and it's frustrating kind of for everybody. So you know, being able to recognize specific items helps kind of at every point of the journey of a customer. Um, and I think that's one of the areas where you know, AI kind of really shines because it's a physical, you know, this is AI in the physical world, not, not sort of online. It's a physical AI. Mm -hmm. And physical AI, you know, relies on computer vision, relies on cameras recognizing stuff. That's the basis of it. Yeah, yeah. So it is enabling, I guess, the digitizing of the store, the physical, uh, now hopefully to make it an awful lot easier, more intuitive and so forth for, for, the, uh, for the shopper. Um, Martin, I know you've got some thoughts on this. Yeah, so it's 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 that relation. I keep talking about the relationship between the retailer and the consumer. Is that ability to learn together? Uh, is that ability to share knowledge? So even the example, rightfully said by Jason around availability, or um, if I uh, shine my mobile phone on a certain section, can I pull out gluten free as an area, and that's the products I, I'm, I'm attracted to because I'm intolerant to wheat, for example. It can be that personalized, but it also can help the retailer learn in terms of now your gluten fee. Free, uh, mm -hmm. So actually, it's the building of the relationship, the knowledge of uh, the knowledge thread between the retailer 
and the consumer is ultimately um, the loyalty thread, which is the future of any retailer and gaining uh, new customers and keeping old customers, but also then that journey of when I walk through the store and in particular on the checkout, which is your final friction point, how do you make that seamless? And that's the an ability to learn my face. I'm over 21 because it's the second time this year I bet uh, I've, I've bought alcohol, for example, so I'll know that anyway. So there's so much technology that is, um, back to my point, a vast uh, algorithm around uh, customer knowledge that will make my journey much easier, but will also make the amount of uh, people around me in the store that will also make my journey easier because it's the fusion between humans as well as AI. It's, it's not just one thing, but it's an exciting space and it's the ability to harness that uh, and create a frictionless experience for the internal customer and the external customer. Yeah. Yeah, no, and everything you said there made perfect sense. Um, apart from the way you said you bought alcohol just the second time this year. We are in August after all, but yeah, anyway. Um, now, something that I mentioned at the top of this uh, that I know is on the minds of probably you know, most, if not every retailer at the moment for all the macro um, economic challenges, which we're, we're not going to go into here because I think everybody's pretty aware of all of those. And, and this is all around um, shrinkage and shrink reduction and using AI to, to uh, enable uh, that. So it, it's a major concern. Um, but Arvin, I wanted to come to, to you because I know that uh, you, you've, um, you guys have done some research on this, but you know, how can this lead to um, re you know, reducing it? How can it lead to significant financial and operational setbacks if you like yeah clearly a massive problem um and growing um, and something that you know i don't think we talk enough about uh, sometimes we kind of hide what the realities are um if you take some of the statistics and our friends at coresight research did some research recently and they it was staggering numbers in the us alone for 2021 1.5% of total retail sales shrink. It was $100 billion. Massive, right? Two thirds of that $100 billion came from two sources, internal or employee theft. And second was external theft, including organized retail crime, which has become um, now uh, uh, everybody's least favorite three-letter acronym, ORC. Yeah. Um, the balance. So in other words, going out the front door. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, or front window. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, the rest uh, of that hundred billion, the, the remaining third, is usually associated with process or control issues. But you know, these figures are before the recent spate of kind of this blatant group larceny type of uh, experience that we're seeing in major metro areas around the U.S. and that is likely driven by inflationary issues that have occurred over the last you know, 12, 18 months, and also attributable to more sophisticated ORC. Um, mm -hmm. I think what's even more disheartening, uh, besides the financial risk and issues that are associated, the, the organized retail crime component, not only is it increasing, but many of these events are also associated with violence and aggression. So there's right. operational risk. There's potential harm to associates. Uh, so it's connected to that financial risk and the implications there for shrink. And I think thirdly, to layer on top of that, consumers start to express concerns about shopping in the locations where there's a higher prevalence of shoplifting or their concerns about yeah. the store closures in the areas they live and work in, concerns about price increases to offset the retailer losses concerns with law enforcement's ability to address it. I, I mean, I think we need some sort of larger industry-wide global push on, on some of these topics, but clearly significant setbacks from shrink. Yeah, no, I agree. And certainly that aspect um, of the uh, abuse, if you like, of retail workers is, is, I mean, here in the UK, I know that people like the Retail Trust and the British Retail Consortium are Doing their utmost, and but they, but the figures from I think last year from the BRC was 850 separate incidents per day of abuse, which could be verbal, but it could also be physical. Um, right. 
Martin, um, actually no, come to you, come to you, Jason. Yeah, come to you. How, in terms of you know reducing shrinkage and using AI. Yeah, I mean, there, there's two um, areas we can look at. What well, one is preventing theft in real time. Okay, so this is, for example, at the self checkout or the or the staff checkout. But say the the self checkout, things like miss scans um, uh, or ticket switching. Uh, or people just sort of walking away, you know, keeping something in their hands and just walking away, or putting something straight, you know, from from the basket area, you know, back into a trolley and, and sort of take, you know, walking away with it. Um, the AI, you know, can detect all of those different scenarios. And and what what we've seen in our research is there's between twenty and thirty different ways that people um, steal at self checkouts. And I can tell you, we've seen some mind blowing things, right? In in the uh, the, the real um, real videos from real stores as we've been doing pilots and trials and, and deploying. Um, there, there's some amazing things that, that people do using their children, you know, to help them steal stuff. I mean, it's pretty shocking um, things that you get to see. But I'd love to ask you, but I suppose we better not share the, uh, the detail here. But um, <laughs> yeah, I was aware of a number of uh, tricks that people have, but not quite that many. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's the obvious one where you put a bottle of wine or champagne down and you say it's carrots, right? Uh, or, or there's the one. The, the thing is, right, there's, there's different types of checkouts. There's ones that are structured where, you know, you have waste scales and there's a structure of going from, say, left to right. Then there's the unstructured checkouts that they have a lot more in, say, Europe, but are starting to become more popular here, where it's complete free for all. There's no sort of structured way that you check out. There's no waste scales. And then when you have like a family come along and you've got kids pulling stuff off and pulling them on, it's just a total free for all. And it's like really hard to see what's going on as a human, let alone as kind of you know, the AI, right? Um, but, but, but anyway, the second, the second thing is collecting insights so you can prevent theft before it happens. And so, for example, one of the studies we did with, with a particular supermarket, um, this was a city center store in Belgium. And we did a study there to see what, what the, you know, the trends were, the insights were in terms of theft. And amazingly, what we found was the most stolen item was sushi, okay? So sushi was the most stolen item at self-checkouts in that store, in that place. And that's something you wouldn't second guess, right? We would never have guessed that it would have been sushi. No. Um, and, and so, you know, if you know that, if you know that sushi is the most stolen item and, it, you know, the, the most common times for it to be stolen is on a particular day or a particular time, you can then, you know, preemptively be watching out for that. You can be on alert when you see somebody taking sushi to the self-checkout, for example, right? Um, and that, that kind of insight can give you, um, you know, some, some, some useful insights into your stock, for example, because obviously everything that's stolen affects your stock management, and that's very disruptive for a store. So all of those insights are, are really, you know, interesting. And then you can go to the next level of it, right? You know, there's a football match. It's Manchester City Centre, sort of, you know, it's near the stadium. Um, it's a sunny day. But all of these things have an impact on, on, on theft and the kind of people that are going to steal. So all of this stuff is, you know, a very interesting, but also um, imminently possible now with AI. Yeah, yeah. mind you, they wouldn't be stealing much uh, Bud Light, would they? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I always remember when I was at um, uh, getting UK retail super truck. It was then part of Kingfisher, which I'm sure people people have heard of. And it used to be the batteries and the razor blades, and they were always near the man checkout because of course you can slip those in your pocket and they're high, relatively high value items. Um, well, apparently, you, apparently yeah. yes, I say, Jack Daniels is one of the most stolen items in UK supermarkets, believe it or not. Oh, all so, oh, right. Yeah. Didn't know that. Maybe a similar thing that you can get a relatively small bottle, but again, high value, depending on what people are going to do with it. Um, Martin, come to you. Uh, because uh, I think, I think Arvin, um, most European retailers would be comfortable, not comfortable, would be better off if it was one and a half. Yeah. I'm certainly here. I'm certainly here and beginning with two, which is a big challenge for a, a lot of retailers. Higher. That if that is mm -hmm. the case, look, um, AI is built to um, analyze big data. We've heard about video just two seconds ago from uh, Jason Predictive, but a AI is also allowed to build in security measures and. 
shrinkage or stock loss is a culture. It's a culture within the organization. It's a culture within the relevant store and how you address it. But AI can actually help uh, from a learning tool point of view in terms of reduce and shrink. Uh, because again, what Jason has already mentioned in terms of awareness and highlighting, enhancing loss prevention in terms of uh, perhaps loss prevention, uh, um, uh, ability to audit uh, what they do, what procedures, what processes are in place to protect the store before even people get in, customer data and also uh, data privacy. Um, believe it or not, AI can help protect um, because obviously it's a learning tool, it uses vast data, and can be protective. A lot of people will automatically think because it's big data and it's AI, that becomes a concern. Actually, if used correctly, AI can help you with reduction of shrink, better LP, um, and obviously better protection of your customer data as well as privacy. So it's a culture and AI can help you with that culture. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, we are amazingly, we are doing okay for time. We've got so just over, 10 minutes. So what I wanted to do in the in the, the last 10 minutes is to kind of get your thoughts on um, uh, some of the key takeaways from this, and then we should have a few minutes for some Q&A. Um, so kind of what, to kick that off, I was, you know, my, my thoughts in terms of, you know, listening to you guys and, and, and so forth, and, and my personal experiences in talking to retailers and technology companies and so forth. I think technology in retail is rapidly, rapidly evolving, whereas AI or, you know, all the other Technologies such as AR, VR, and so forth, that, uh, and, and, uh, and so forth that we covered, um, it's clear that enhancing the customer experience, you know, AI can en enable uh, that. Uh, and then we spoke specifically on shrink, you know, a, a highly topical subject, shrink reduction. And I, you know, I think that um, if you haven't started your AI journey, because as you just said, Martin, AI is learning all the time, and so forth. Um, certainly my Alexa is, she's learning my voice, which is great. Other Siri and others are available. Um, but, you know, start the AI journey now, I think is for me, any of you know, uh, uh, the message, but also kind of don't treat it as um, the silver bullet. And there's something I think uh, that, again, you might have said, Martin, was about the human aspect. And I've always thought that you need, it's almost like, you need to have that human hand on the tiller, on the rudder or whatever we, we want to visualize it as, because otherwise, and I think that probably applies more with, which we haven't gone into because we haven't had enough time, but another area obviously is chat GPT, as I've mentioned, you know, generative AI, you know, which is, you know, a separate, almost separate topic and so exciting. But let's get um, some of your uh, thoughts. So I'll, I'll come back to you, Arvin, in terms of your sort of, key takeaways, thoughts, and, and, and so forth in terms of what we covered. Yeah, you know, I, I think maybe to help make this practical for everybody, um, there's things you can do with AI, but what are the real benefits? What are the outcomes that you would hope for with those applications, right? If you're able to create more personal journeys using AI to know mm -hmm. your customer, it'll create greater trust, engagement, loyalty. Uh, I'd say another takeaway, if we enable journeys with less friction, it saves a shopper time or creates a happier path to purchase, we'll generate repeat purchase, maybe even increase the basket size, things all retailers would hope for. Similarly, if we enhance self-checkout with AI, we have fewer interventions, fewer produce pick menu type of interventions or age verifications, we allow more store traffic to actually funnel through self-service channels, which is less costly to operate and creates labor savings or application of that labor to other places within the store. Uh, leveraging vision-based recognition technology and appropriate analytics tool sets will not only identify shrink, as Jason said, but help prevent that loss and the associated mm -hmm. financial leakage at the store which are obvious operational benefits. So I think the long and short of it is the ROI justification is definitely there for those who adopt it and integrate it into their operations early. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, and I think, I mean, the, you know, I saw again here in the UK, I think it was the uh, the Tesco uh, AGM a few weeks back and there was some 
protesting going on from people who thought the self-service, oh, we don't like that, you know, we don't want to do that. But then you think, well, you kind of put your fuel in your own car and, and so forth. You've got, so I think, you know, this is what I was going back to what I said earlier, that there's a little bit of a journey still, perhaps, and it's it's a process of, of, of education, uh, but we've got to make it easy as possible for, uh, for people and, and take them on that journey. Um, Indeed. Jason, concerns, challenges, opportunities for AI adoption in retail. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, the, the way I, 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 you know, like to think about adopting AI, this type of AI, right, which is physical, real-time AI. Okay, it's like hiring a human sort of new member of staff, right? You would never expect a new member of staff to be performing 100% perfectly from day one. And the same is true with this kind of physical AI, okay? It needs time to bed in. It needs time to, to learn to adjust to, to the lighting conditions, to the types of, say, trolleys or baskets that are in that particular store, you know, to the specifics of the store and the use cases that you, you have, um, you know, put it you know, to use for. And, it, you know, like a human being, it needs feedback, right? And then through feedback, that's how it learns. And yes, AI is moving towards, you know, fully automated feedback loops, but I think we're a way away from that. And I think that, that you know, there's always, I think, a place for human, you know, humans in the loop in terms of, you know, making sure, I think if we've said before, to, to have a have an eye on it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so with, with that in mind, uh, I think in terms of adopting AI, you know, the, um, the, the, the retailers need to look for partners rather than just vendors. This is not just a bit of software that you're going to take off the shelf and expect to work perfectly. You know, that's the first thing. The second thing is, is it, it, it's got to be a system that is able to continuously learn and adapt. Because one thing is for sure, when you've plugged in all of the, um, when you've covered all of the areas where people currently steal, they will find new ways of stealing. That's just human nature. Right. And so the so the mm. technology has got to be able to learn and adapt to new ways that people behave um, and and interact with, with the systems. Um, and, and I guess the, the sort of the third and final thing really is um, deploying, you know, developing something in a lab environment and deploying it in the real world are two very, very different things because the world is very unpredictable um, and human beings behave very un unpredictably. Um, and so, you know, expect anything could happen and, and make sure the AI is able to sort of cope with very unexpected situations. I, yeah. I, I guess those, those are the kind of the key things, I would say. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, in terms of summarising, last final thoughts, Martin, you're going to get the last word on that. Um, and then we'll have a few minutes for some uh, Q&A because we've got a couple of questions that have come in. Cool. Uh, so look, from my side, it's, um, it is a journey. I think Jason and Arvin have, have depicted it really well. I think it's uh, uh, small and then scale, uh, go with partners, ensure that it's part of your overall strategy. That's the key thing and clearly embedded. But AI has already the ability to improve things. But again, back to the security measures that we mentioned earlier on as well. So it is a a tool and an opportunity for all retailers, especially in, in light of today's environment and challenges for retailers and consumers. Um, so I think we embrace it uh, within the realms of good governance, but I think the ability and the capability is uh, an opportunity that Arvind said the ROI is already there. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, okay, no, that's great. So um, I mentioned we've got a couple of questions that have come in. So, um, First one here, and this can be to either Martin or Arvin, whoever's quickest on the buzzer. Um, what is some advice you can give to retailers who are hesitant to adopt AI? Um, is this an opportunity to work with AI and address major challenges? But I, I guess it's really, you know, what's the advice that you can give uh, for yeah, somebody who's hesitant? Who wants to tell that, Arvin or, or, or Martin first? I'll, I'll take that. Um, most recently, okay. Two, okay. two, 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 recent, two recent clients that have asked the same question. And I think it, it I think I mentioned a few of them as well. And Jason actually, so it's probably a summary of reinforcing uh, the great message that uh, all four of us are, are giving the audience. I think you need to have that clear strategy of why you're using AI and it has to be mm -hmm. embedded. It can't be a bolt on. If you put it as a bolt in, it, it's never integrated. And actually, this has a, a full change management in terms of operations, customer facing. So actually, clear strategy 
uh, Jason, rightfully so, build the right partnership. It's not a short term thing and make sure the partnership and who you're going with is uh, understands it, has the right governance and has the right cultural fit into your culture. That really is important in terms of managing any risk as well. Uh, this is about employees interacting. This is about uh, making sure that great communication, um, uh, great understanding, uh, great buy-in. This is a transformation and we all know a transformation is a cultural transformation because it's the ways of working that changes as well. So any training, any development, make sure that everybody is informed of why you're doing it, how you're doing it, including the external customer in terms of great communication. Why are you taking data? Why are you using the data? It's okay. We're in a world of data. We all have various uh, membership cards and all the rest of it. So, and people ask us all our data. So it's being comfortable, but being transparent as well. And as I said, right at the very end, maybe my last summary part start small mm. and then scale because it's much yeah. diff very difficult to change when you're at scale so make sure it's right it's right for you right for your uh, purpose your mission and your uh, strategy and then build uh, this around the two most important things in your uh, business which is your internal customer and your external customer yeah yeah, yeah. Arvin, um, you got anything to... to yeah, I'll add on to that. that. I think it was really nicely summarized, but maybe a couple additional things. Uh, you know, really start with the problem statement, the, the thing you're really trying to solve for, and then put the consumer at the center of that design process, right? Really use some design thinking in the process before applying the technology. Um, use data to test and learn, constantly refine. Don't simply deploy the technology for technology's sake. I think if AI, if done right, really has the power to augment the human capabilities that we apply within store operations, as opposed to replacing them. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind that the design process has to take in the stakeholders of the staff as well. And, uh, you know, the example I'll give, and I didn't get a chance to share these stats, but in some of the trials we've done with age verification, a normal ID check which might account for about 30 to 50% of staff interventions at a self-checkout, um, will take about 30 seconds for each verification to occur. And as a result, people will avoid using self-checkout to, to, as, their, as their checkout option. But when we use age verification, we can cut that time in half to under 15 seconds. We don't need the help or support of a staff member who can be now mm -hmm. supporting other customers. And then we see a higher adoption rate. 70% of the folks who used uh, or, or had uh, the opportunity to use an age-restricted product at a self-checkout did. And that's that's tremendous adoption. So this is the perfect balance of finding yeah. how AI can work together to augment human human capabilities. So great statistics. Yeah. Great statistics. Yeah. Yeah, great point. Um, okay, we've just got time for one more. Was Jason going to um, push towards yourself? So, how can AI work together with humans? Martin was kind of mentioning you, alluding to that earlier, weren't you? Um, so, how can AI work together with humans? What does that collaborative process look like? Yeah, so I mean, AI really should be about enhancing humans and not replacing them. And that's certainly, you know, the, the kind of sort of AI that, that sea change focuses on, right? And here's some sort of examples of how that can be the case. Um, if you're a member of staff at a self-checkout, self the last thing you want to have to do is intervene when somebody is potentially stealing stuff, right? That's very uh, stressful and, you know, leads to a lot of anxiety for that person in that role. What, what we found with, with our sort of uh, trials and uh, um, deployments is 80% of shoppers who try to either purposefully or accidentally steal something or, or, or um, let's say, miscan something will correct that if they are nudged at the checkout. And so that, you know, um, right there it is uh, a uh, enhancing the, the, the role for that attendant because it's making their job less stressful, but B, it's freeing them up you know, to do other higher, you know, quality things. If you look at um, a security guard, traditionally security guards will stare at uh, security screens looking for needles in haystacks, right? It's a pretty tedious job. The AI is presenting them, you know, proactively with the needle and the haystack at the same time. Um, and so they can be, you know, um, A, much more efficient, but B, if you have a team of security guards, you know, um, watching over say 200 stores, the same team with AI could probably look after 
a thousand or two thousand stores. Okay, so it just it increases the unit value of each of those human beings in that in that role. Um, I mean, the third simple example is notifying when there is stock, you know, missing from the shelves. Again, instead of having people constantly patrolling the aisles looking for for low stock, which is again a very tedious job for a human being, you know, the AI can can proactively tell them where and when to restock items. Three examples. Yeah. yeah. No, that's great. That's great. And, and that is a great place to end. We're just about out of time. So all it remains is for me is to thank our fantastic panel, Martin, Arvin, Jason. Uh, it's been great. I've learned uh, quite a bit about the AI in retail and I hope our audience have too. So that's a wrap for this webinar. Thank you so much for joining us and hopefully see you again next time. Thank you. Thank you.